Good afternoon. And as I said over in Glen Hoy, no, your eyes are not deceiving you. It is me. <laughs> I have returned. No, I haven't been on holiday. I, uh, I know every time William comes here, I'm not here. He keeps ribbing me. <laughs> Welcome to our service of worship here today as we gather together to worship Almighty God. And we have visitors out this morning. Loads of uh, visitors, you're very welcome. I trust and pray that as we gather here to worship God, that you will be blessed and that he will be glorified. You've all been given a little announcement sheet on your way in. I'm going to, uh, just before we come before God and worship, I want to bring your attention to a couple, I bring to your attention a couple of announcements, one of which is not on the announcement sheet, and that is uh, next, next Sunday is Communion Sunday. So uh, as we gather, can I encourage you to come out as we gather around the Lord's table so we meet for this important uh, event in, our, in our, our church calendar. And then uh, in the evening, we have a Thanksgiving service here in Clogher at 7.30 p.m. And there will be the facility for people who were unable to attend communion service in the morning to take communion at the end of that particular service. So... Next, next Sunday is communion service and a Thanksgiving service in the evening at 7.30 p.m. here. With regards to the announcement sheet itself, uh, can I, I'm not going to go down through all of them. I'll leave that for you to, to read at your leisure. But can I just, uh, the one a couple of things I want to highlight is the youth club. We'll be meeting this incoming Friday. This will be our final youth club for the season. We're going to take a break for the uh, summer recommence in September. As it's the final one, we're going to have a barbecue for the children and their parents at the end of that. So can I encourage you to come along to it if, if your children who fit in that category. Indeed, encourage our helpers, our leaders, I remind them to come out uh, or to be there for about 6.40 to help with setup, etc. You'll see Little Lambs uh, is on there, hopes to meet Wednesday the 10th of May in the Billy Hall. The timings are on there for all babies, preschoolers and their carers. Please spread the word uh, uh, and, and, and advertise on social media. Another uh, two more items I want to bring to your attention. Firstly, the Salzer Prayer Letter, the Soldiers and Airmen Scripture Readers Association Prayer Letter for May is available in the vestibule. And finally, you'll see a paragraph there on the welcome pack. That's a new uh, inclusion on that, the welcome pack. This is to help inform people who've just moved into the area about Clocker PC. This little welcome pack basically has been prepared and can either be put through the letterbox of the house or given to the person directly, personally. It, all it is is a very simple thing. It contains an A5-sized letter which welcomes them, provides some basic information on the activities of here as a church, as well as important things, uh, other important information such as the nearest NEs, doctors and dentists. This is for people who are new to the area. It also contains a tea bag, some UHT milk and a chocolate bar to provide refreshment. All of it is contained in a little zip seal bag. And these are packs are available on request from me. So if someone is in the process of moving in beside you or near you, please uh, contact me and I can make up one of these little uh, bags and uh, yeah, give it to you and you can drop around with it or pop it through their door. Those are all the announcements that I have for you. You can read the rest at your own leisure. We're now going to turn to God's word and we're our reading this morning or this afternoon as it is now is taken from Galatians chapter 3. Now the, the uh, part where or the verses we're looking at in particular will be verses 10 to 14 but to give them context we're going to reading from verse 1 of chapter 3. So Galatians chapter 3 beginning at verse 1. If you have your Bibles with you please turn to this particular reading. If you're using one of the pew Bibles that can be found on page 1000. 169. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? 
Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law? Or because you believe what you heard? Consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. And we end our reading in verse 14 and thank God for this reading from his truth. As humans, God has endowed us with the ability to problem solve. To consider the issue at hand, and where possible, come up with a solution. But to get to that solution, we may come up with different potential options. And when that happens, we then have to work out which one is the most likely to succeed. This may be something we do on our own, or we may enlist the help of someone we know to be wiser and more experienced than ourselves. With their wisdom, and experience, they may be able to tell us what will work and what won't. And if we are wise, we will follow their advice. Not to do so would not only be extremely foolish on our part, but also very insulting to them. Because in effect, we would be saying that we either do not trust them or that we know better than them. Therefore, if we choose to ignore their advice and we fail... We have nobody, only ourselves, to blame. Now, in the, in, the number, in the previous weeks I've been with you, we have been looking at the letter the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of churches in the Roman province of Galatia, as it was then. He did so to counter false teaching these believers there had been exposed to and had come to accept. The central issue at hand, which Paul was addressing, is one that humanity has been faced with since Adam and Eve sinned against God. Namely, how to overcome the problem caused by our sin. How can we get right with a holy God who cannot tolerate sin? How can we gain his favor and be accepted by him? How can we be saved from his righteous wrath? That's a question which all of us, regardless of who we are, face. And in the section of Paul's letter that we're looking at today, verses 10 to 14 of Galatians 3, he explains the stark reality that depending upon which course of action we take, we will either be subject to the curse of God or the blessing of God. There is no middle ground, you see, when it comes to the issue of salvation. We're either saved or we're not. The Galatian believers had been conned into believing that in order to be saved, you had to observe the ceremonial and moral laws of Judaism as well as putting your faith in Christ. In other words, it was a, a Christ plus religion. Salvation was not simply a matter of faith in Christ. You had, to, you had your part to play as well. It was something you had to work for. That is what they'd come to believe. But Paul tells us that Christ, that, it, that Christ plus anything else equals nothing. And in the verses that precede this section, 
he laid out evidence to prove his point. And when we get to these verses, we find him hammering this point home further, wherein he highlights two things for us. Firstly, the futility of relying on good works. And secondly, the sufficiency of faith in Christ. <clears throat> Firstly, then, the futility of relying on good works. Paul begins his argument by saying, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Now the law that Paul refers to here in this instance is the moral law, otherwise known as the Ten Commandments, which are an expression of the character and will of God. So what Paul says here is that everyone who relies on being able to keep the Ten Commandments for their salvation, as opposed to pleasing God, are actually under a curse. They are so because God's standards are perfect. So he requires nothing less than total, constant obedience to the entire law. Every detail of his law must be adhered to constantly, and failure to do so will result in being cursed by God as opposed to being blessed by him. <clears throat> now this was not merely Paul's opinion. Rather it is stipulated elsewhere in scripture. In Deuter Deuteronomy 27 verse 26. Which Paul quotes from here. It says cursed is everyone. Who does not continue to do everything written. In the book of the law. So unless a person is able to do everything. Stipulated by the law of God. All of the time. They stand to receive God's curse, not his blessing. Now the idea of God cursing us does not sit easy with our modern mindsets. Because we have distilled God down to being a friendly, cuddly, loving deity who doesn't take offense at our sin. We don't like the idea of being held to account for our sinfulness. We don't like the idea of being, we don't like the thought of being cursed by God whereby we are rejected by him and subjected to eternal damnation. But just because we don't like it doesn't change the reality of it. Jesus Christ even spoke of people being cursed for having rebelled against and rejected God. In Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus said that those who reject God will be told, depart from me. You who are cursed, enter the eternal fire preserved, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, of course, many people will claim that they have not rejected God or rebelled against him. But if they have, have ignored what his word, the Bible, teaches with regards to the need for and the means of salvation, then that is exactly what they have done. Therefore, let us be in no doubt Trying to win God's favor by being good people is futile. Because our goodness, which is measured by flawed standards, is never good enough. Many people, though, object to that teaching. But by doing so, they forget the principle which Christ taught, namely, that to fully comply with the requirements of the Ten Commandments, we have not only to keep them outwardly, but also inwardly. For example, Jesus taught that in order to not to be guilt in order not to be guilty of breaking the seventh commandment, do not commit adultery. We have not only to refrain from adulterous relationships, but also from having lustful thoughts. In Matthew five, verses twenty seven to twenty eight, it records him saying, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He also taught that in order to fully comply with the sixth commandment, do not murder, we need to not only refrain from the physical act of murder, but also from hateful, injurious thoughts about others who have wronged us in some way. So with this in mind, we can see that no one can keep the Ten Commandments in their entirety continuously. And as that is the case, since we cannot keep God's law, it cannot bless us. 
all it can do is curse us. Therefore, the very thing that some people believe makes them commendable to God actually condemns them. A similar principle applies today with the laws of the land which we are subject to. If we adhere to those laws, we have nothing to worry about. But if we breach them even by the smallest amount, then the law we have breached will condemn us and cause us to be subject to the prescribed penalty. For example, we all know the speed limit on motorways and dual carriages way here in the UK is 70 miles per hour. If you stick to that speed limit, then you have nothing to worry about if you see that police car behind you in the rearview mirror. But if you have exceeded the speed limit, even by the smallest amount, then the law requires that you be held to account. So those who rely on upon keeping the law are to put it in another way. Those who rely on good living, as we might call it, for their salvation, will not be blessed by God. They will not find favour with him. As verse 11 tells us, no one is justified before God by the law. You may recall me previously explaining what it means to be justified by God before God. But in case you weren't here then or in case you have forgotten, in the words of John Stott, to be justified before God is the opposite of being condemned by him. It is to be declared righteous, to be accepted by him, to stand in his favour and under his smile. With this in mind, verse 11 tells us in no uncertain terms that no amount of good living, no amount of commendable deeds, otherwise known as good works, will justify us before God. No one ever has been or ever will be justified before God in this way. Everyone who chooses to do so will rather be cursed by him because they have failed to meet his standards. And his law requires that they be held to account. See, God simply cannot sweep sin under the carpet. He cannot ignore it or pretend it hasn't happened. He has to deal with it in accordance with his holy and righteous character. Otherwise, he would not be true to himself. So as we read verses 10 and 11, the implication is that all of us, all of us, without exception, are lawbreakers. And as such, unless that is remedied, we will be cursed by God. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because God in his mercy has provided a means of salvation for us through faith in Christ. So here in these verses, having reminded us about the futility of relying on good works for salvation, Paul also reminds us of the sufficiency of faith in Christ which is my second point. In the verses which precede these ones, Paul repeatedly made the point that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But Paul knew his detractors well. He knew them well enough to know that they would ask how this is so. Therefore, in verses 13 to 14, he gives us an explanation. Verse 13 tells us that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us. That term redeemed means to buy back something which belonged to you. In Paul's day, if people were unable to pay their debts, they could be sold as slaves. And this term was commonly used in the slave market, where people were redeemed from a life of slavery by relatives or friends who paid the going price for a slave. But in verse 13, we're told that Christ redeemed us by becoming a curse for us, which in essence means that he took the full measure, penalty, and consequences of our failure to abide by the law of God on himself. He voluntarily took God's curse upon himself to deliver us from it. <coughs> to put it another way, he substituted himself for us. Or in the words of the well-known hymn, Man of Sorrows, In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. In the days of the slave market, that would be equivalent 
for a friend or a relative willingly forsaking their own freedom by becoming a, play, a slave in your place so that you can go free. To reinforce this point, Paul quoted from Deuteronomy 21, verse 33, saying, Cursed is everyone who hung, is hung on a tree. Now, to us, that doesn't make much sense. And the point Paul makes here is lost on us, so let me attempt to explain. Under Mosaic law, the law given to Moses and then given to the people, every criminal was sentenced to death, or every criminal sentenced to death was usually executed by stoning. And then their body was hanged on a tree until sunset. This was done to expose their capital crime to public shame and to demonstrate that they were under God's curse. Now, as we know, Christ was nailed to a cross, not a tree, but to the mindset of the time, it was equivalent to being so. Therefore, upon being crucified as he was, Christ was seen to be under God's curse. And that is the reason why so many Jews could not accept the idea of Jesus being the Messiah. To them, it was a complete contradiction in terms that the Messiah, the anointed one of God, should be cursed by God. You know, many people today believe that the gospel is a fabrication, simply made up, a fictional tale made up by men who were only after one thing, personal gain for themselves. But if that is what you are inclined to believe, let me ask you this. Why would Paul and the other apostles, including Peter, publicly proclaim something which was so scandalous at the time and make it central to everything they taught? Why would they proclaim that salvation is through faith in a man who was obviously cursed by God? If they had made it up, they would have come up with something that was more palatable and sensible, something that would be easier for people to accept, something that, as we might say, was more saleable. But they didn't. They simply laid the facts out as they were, making no secret of the fact that Christ was crucified. Indeed, as I said previously, it was central to everything that they taught. For example, Peter was standing before the Sanhedrin, the highest Jewish religious court in the land, who had instructed him and the other apostles to stop teaching the people about the death and resurrection of Christ, Peter said, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. And Paul, in, the, in verse 1 of chapter 3, of this very letter states, before your very eyes, Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Humanly speaking, what they taught was nonsense and was actually a hindrance to their evangelistic efforts. As Paul said so himself, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But whilst they knew this, they could teach nothing else because it is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So here in verse 13, Paul reminds us that in order to fix the problem caused by sin, God's righteous judgment for sin had to be satisfied. Divine justice had to be done and be seen to be done. So the sinless Son of God became sin for us and faced his Heavenly Father's righteous wrath. He took the curse of God that we deserve and in doing so he provides the means of redemption for us. But that redemption is only available by faith. As Paul states in verse 14, he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the Spirit. Prior to this, Paul had reminded his readers about how it was only by faith in God, taking God at his word, trusting him without reservation, that Abraham was considered righteous, that is to say, acceptable to God. And here in verse 14, 
Paul states that the blessing given to Abraham is available to anyone, regardless of their background, by faith. But what is that blessing, you may ask? Well, it's threefold. Firstly, there is justification, being put in favor with God, becoming acceptable to him. Secondly, there is eternal life, being received into fellowship with God. And then thirdly, there is the promise of the Holy Spirit, being indwelt, transformed, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's the threefold blessing of God that every person receives when they come to faith. Those blessings cannot be earned by achievement. They can only be received by faith. It was through Christ that God acted for our salvation. So it's only through Christ that we can receive it. I said at the very start that the central issue which Paul seeks to address in these verses is one that humanity has been faced with since Adam and Eve sinned against God. Namely, how to overcome the problem caused by our sin. How can we get right with the holy God? So with that in mind, if you forget everything else I have said here this afternoon, remember this. When it comes to being rescued from God's curse, faith in our good works doesn't work. Only faith in Christ's work upon the cross does. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest upon and abide with you forevermore. Amen.